Good morning. Welcome to our Declassified on Corn Gold. I'm Paul Allen Sommerfeld, so I'll be leading you through talking mostly about Captain Blood today, seeing as how that's what we're going to screen right afterward. So let's begin. So who was Eric Wolfgang Korngold? His parents thought he would be successful from the start. It was intentional that they gave him the middle name Wolfgang. And that <laughs> proved prophetic because he was essentially a genius, or at the very least, a very talented from a young age composer. He wrote Die Schneemann, which is a ballet pantomime in the 1910s, and when he was about 12, 13, and it was wildly successful, and that's jump-started his career as a composer in Vienna throughout the teens and 20s. So several photos of him with his parents, him by himself, and then at the end of his life at the piano. But he was wildly successful in the 20s and 30s, mostly of operas. You might be familiar with his opera, Die Tote Stadt, from the early 20s. That's probably his most well-known opera. It's been performed by the Met and other American opera companies. It has more of a presence here. But then why do we know him as a film composer in the US? And part of that, we'll get to some of these images here in a second, but part of that has to do with what happened in the 1930s politically. So in 1934, his dear, his good friend Max Reinhardt asked him if he wanted to, asked Korngold if he wanted to go with him to Hollywood because they had, or Reinhardt had recently done a successful adaptation of A Midsummer Night's Dream using Mendelssohn's incidental music and asked Korngold if he wanted to go with him to Hollywood to make it into a film. And Korngold said, sure. <laughs> so he came along, it was a successful adaptation, and he was able to have a lot more control over the music, partly because he had this prestige as this famous European composer. So he did um, A Midsummer Night's Dream and went back to Vienna. The following year, in 1935, he was asked if he wanted to come back, and he was enticed by, saying, by the offer of being able to do more opera, operetta films like A Midsummer Night's Dream. So he came back to do, oh, we'll come back to this. He came back to do Give Us This Night, which eventually came out in 36. And that was working with Oscar Hammerstein, the lyricist, who I'm sure many of you know from later on his fame with Richard Rogers for all of uh, Oklahoma, Carousel, The Sound of Music. That project, didn't turn out so well. I'm sure I'm, very few people even know that that film <laughs> exists. But while he was working on Give Us This Night, he was asked if he wanted to score the film for Captain Blood, which was this new vehicle that the studio had been working on with Errol Flynn and Olivia de Havilland, who were at that point completely unknown. This, was their, this would become their big break. He screened the film gave it some thought, and was finally talked into it. There's a longer story there, but we don't have time to really get into that right now. But he got talked into it, but he only had three weeks to complete the score. So he was working on Give Us This Night and <laughs> Captain Blood at the same time. And the consequences of that we'll get into with the opening credits. So that was his start into film composition. He went back to Hall or went back to Vienna after that, and then came back in '38, eventually doing *The Adventures of Robin Hood*, another now famous Errol Flynn, Olivia de Havilland film, and stayed in Hollywood thereafter because *Kristallnacht* happened, and his father and mother had had the foresight to already secure visas in advance, and so the rest of the family joined him in LA, and they stayed there for the duration of the war. He then received a very cushy contract from Warner Brothers, which is advantageous and almost unheard of even to this day. He, was, he only had to score two films a year, two. And he retained the rights to the music that he scored for these films, also an unheard of stipulation in his contract. 
This is for, by contrast, Max Steiner, who I'm sure many, sure many of you are aware of, scored Gone with the Wind and many other films of the 30s and 40s, worked doggedly scoring dozens of films a year and had no rights to the actual music once the film was completed. And Korngold was making, doing two films a year, the equivalent in 2019 of about a half a million dollars a year. So a very cushy life for him by way of contrast. Now that didn't stop him from asserting his opinions. One of my favorite things in the collection that we have out there is a letter from a Warner Brothers exec saying, I understand that there are parts of our picture, Devotion, which was in 43, which you do not like. And while you are, of course, fully entitled to your private opinions, I would greatly appreciate it as a personal favor if you not make your criticisms too public since I have had certain reactions from them which are detrimental to the best interests of the picture. So he was a very opinionated filmmaker <laughs> in all of his collaborations. And you can see right next to that his Warner Brothers ID card, which is outside as well. So here we are, 1935. Korngold is working on Give It or Captain Blood what would become his first, quote unquote, original film score. When I say the words classical Hollywood style, this refers to this time period of the 1930s and 40s in particular, where these aesthetic practices, these style characteristics that became sort of codified, that they became standard, and they live with us today with how Hollywood films look, how they sound, how they're constructed. And some of those characteristics are this attention to realism, that it has to feel real, that we have to relate to the characters. And it doesn't mean that it is real, but it feels real, so hence realism. The internal logic of the film has to work. Now this still rings true even today. Think about films like Lord of the Rings or fan fantasy epics or the Marvel films. In the internal world, the diegetic world of the film itself, there is still this realism. And when it doesn't quote, or it doesn't work maybe, it's partly because, oh, that didn't feel realistic to me. I mean, I think everybody has gone to a movie or watched a movie and said, oh, well, the characters just didn't feel realistic. So it has to have this realism to it. Part of that then too is this idea of narrative continuity. So the film has to make sense as it progresses. We have to understand the plot. Now this is characteristic of Hollywood film. If you think of French New Wave later on in the 20th century or, compose, or um, directors like Godard, narrative continuity, not as much as an important factor. But in Hollywood film, we have to understand how the film is unfolding. Then that leads us to the psychological association where we have to relate to the characters in some way. We have to feel what they're feeling or understand what their motivations are, but it's centered in that psychological aspect. And then through all of this, the music's role is this sonic suture. It welds the image to that realism. Where, because what is a film? It's a series of shots that are spliced together to create narrative continuity. It's not, very rarely do you see one long continuous take, especially in the 1930s, you could only make a take last maximum a couple of minutes, maximum. Films don't last just two minutes, so you have to splice together those shots, those scenes in a way that makes sense, and music helps create that air of realism. It's that sonic suture. It sews the film together for us to consume, to experience. And then that leads us to this idea of the fantastical gap, that there's this gap between us, the viewers, in the theater, the film that we're watching on screen, and the music is, that, is what helps us bridge that fantastical gap, that we dive into the film, that sense of realism, that sense of associating with the characters, understanding their motivations, being moved by what they do and what happens to them. What you see on the side here are cutting notes to the film Juarez, which was another film that Korngold scored. And these are notes from a studio exec listing minute changes to be made to the cut of the film. And they are incredibly minute. They can be as, as minute as 
cut this shot here, substitute this one shot here, cut out the music or lower the music on these couple of seconds. For example, if we have one here in Juarez where it says, hold the music down under the dialogue in the bunkhouse. As soon as, oh, I'm sorry, this is not Juarez. This is Captain Blood. What I have outside is Juarez. Hold the music down under the dialogue in the bunkhouse. As soon as Blood begins the to, to talk, hold the dialogue way down. Hold the music way down under the dialogue. You'll have to drop the dialogue way down too. So he's saying repeatedly, drop the dialogue. But it's these minute attentions to how the film sounds and making sure, especially that we hear the dialogue. Because dialogue gets us back to narrative continuity. We have to understand what's going on in the film. And the music helps shapes that, shape that understanding, but it can't drown out the dialogue. Or when it does take over the dialogue, it's for a key reason, like a fight scene, because then the motivations, the needs are different. But these are the kinds of details that they would have to work with. And these kind of cuts affect Korngold as well, especially if they're happening after he started writing music or if it's in different stages of post-production. Again, demonstrating how film music composition is a collaborative art from its inception. Korngold couldn't just walk, well, he would begin by walking in, screening the film, and playing at the piano, and coming up with ideas. But that wasn't the end. That was only the very beginning, because thereafter, he has to work with various other filmmakers to get everything to sync just right to make a film that people can relate to, that they can understand, and move them in some way. So that leads us then now to Captain Blood. These are just some press materials that the studio created to send to theaters to market the film. One of my favorites is to create a gangplank entrance. A week in advance of opening, set up a gangplank leading to Ticket Chopper. As patrons file in, your man counts them, offering a pair of free tickets to every hundredth customer. So all kinds of talking points, ways to market the film. Because this film became a smash success. This was Errol Flynn and Olivia de Havilland's first role together. This is what rocketed both of them to stardom. And this was the first of many swashbuckler films. The Sea Hawk, The Sea Wolf, The Adventures of Robin Hood. They're all in this sort of same vein of style, these adventure stories. Um, so then what does that kind of film sound like? How do you create that sense of genre expectations when you go in to see a film. So what we're going to do now is I'm going to play the opening titles to Captain Blood. And what I would like you to do is to listen first to any primary themes that you may hear. There are two, really, to listen for. Two different themes. Think about what they sound like, what kind of, what would you expect listening to this. And then I also would like you to pay close attention to how Korngold himself is credited in this in the opening in the opening sequence because that's very important for understanding this movie.
So, what, how, uh, would anybody like to share what, what one of the melodies was that they heard, or how would you describe it? Yeah, exactly. So there, she's saying there's the go get them first part, and then the second part being this sort of love thing. What was the difference in instrumentation for those two themes? Brass for the first one, and then the sweeping strings for the second. So we already have this contrast set up, this very brash, bombastic sort of fanfare, followed with lots of leaps and skips, and then we have this very stepwise sweeping gesture. And she said something about love. So you watch these, this opening sequence. What do you think this movie's gonna be about? Maybe a love, definitely a love story component, but is it solely a love story? Yeah, we've got some sort of heroism aspect. You see, we all know this just from watching. It's part of this genre expectations. And part of this is built up over, for all of us now in the 21st century, we've seen a lot of movies, probably. We've gone to lots of movies. We understand almost intuitively because we've consumed so much content that we have an idea. It's just like when you go into, if you're going to see a romantic comedy, you have a certain set of expectations of what's going to happen. Music is really important to establishing what those expectations are. So we have the brass bombast and then the sweeping string statement. How was Korngold credited? Musical arrangements. And, um, does anybody have any idea why he would say, why it says musical arrangements and not like, composed by or music by? Does anybody remember? I'm sorry? Not because of that. He borrowed for one key sequence. Well, um, spoiler alert if you haven't seen the movie, but even if you haven't seen the movie, you can probably guess what happens by the end, especially in this classical Hollywood style sort of film. He later, in halfway, about halfway in the movie, he has this duel with another pirate, played by Basil Rathbone, who I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Um, he used for that sequence some music by Liszt and had it orchestrated for that particular sequence. And the reason why is he had three weeks to write the score and this sequence had to get done. And there was no way, he, he did not have the time to write original music for that sequence. So he worked with his orchestrator, Hugo Friedhofer, to create an orchestrated version of this and they went with that. So still, over 90% of the music is his. He could have said music by or composed by. And the reason he did not is part of his baggage, his history, where Korngold didn't want anybody to think that he was claiming to have written that music. And I think that this partly goes back to his life in Vienna prior to Hollywood. His, his father, Julius Korngold, was a very powerful and famous music critic in Vienna. And throughout his life in the teens and 20s, Korngold always heard murmurings of other people saying, well, he's only famous because of his father, or he's only getting good reviews because of his father. So I think there's this idea of wanting to make sure that everybody thought that he was an honest individual, or that he wasn't claiming to have written Liszt music. So that's why it says musical arrangements. So, but then to pivot back, we've got those two main themes. Now those two themes govern almost the entire film score. They help articulate what's happening to Blood, how Captain Blood, how he's feeling about things, and they all, in the second theme in particular, which is what we're gonna focus on today, articulates his relationship with Arabella, played by Olivia de Havilland. So that's what I all just said, establishes two primary themes, our expectations are established, and it helps us understand the narrative development of the film. And you can see these are from his sketches, and then here, the two different themes 
very contrasting in style. So he creates some thematic changes off the get-go in this film. From this sketch, if you, you can kind of see it at the top, I'll blow it up here, where it's just labeled boat. Why is it labeled boat? And you can see it's the, it's the main theme. At this point in the film, this is about 13 minutes in, he's been sold into slavery in the Caribbean. And so he's being transported on a ship across the Caribbean. And this is what we see and hear. <laughs> That sound a little familiar? It's still that same theme, but what's different? It's in a minor mode. He's not so successful right now. He's not the hero. That's, and in fact, we don't hear the um, major mode fanfare version until he's once again, when he's escaped slavery and he's become a pirate much later in the film. So it's articulating for us now, oh, the things are not great for Peter Blood. So there are other functions that music can fulfill. And I just want to touch on those briefly before we continue with Blood and Arabella's relationship. Music can articulate a sense of place. I don't have time to play the clip right now, but notice when you watch the film today, the music that you hear when we arrive in Port Royal, and then later when we arrive in Tortuga. It's this sense of othering and exoticism, where that's not really the music that those peoples would have playing. I mean, in fact, we're in 1685. They didn't have <laughs> a modern day symphonic orchestra either. But he uses the chimbalum and the celeste to create this sense of other, this sense of exoticism. And this is a very problematic coding in classical Hollywood style, which is another topic in and of itself. But it's creating the sense of othering, that we're in this other place. So music also can fulfill that role. Another thing that music can do is what we use this term Mickey Mousing. Does anybody have an idea what Mickey Mousing might mean? Yeah, exactly, like the person's climbing up the stairs and the music is ascending, or they're falling and the music is descending. So it's often used as this derogatory term and often associated with Max Steiner as him being the sort of king of Mickey Mousing. You can look at a score of King Kong and you can see many, many examples of that. But it can also be an effective technique for articulating what's happening on screen. And this is a great example of that. Put aside side with him, men! <laughs> So what happened there? <laughs> we hear everybody laughs. So you, you caught the joke. The music we hear this tied with the swinging as he's being thrown overboard. And it's effective. It helps articulate the action. We understand what's happening or draws our attention. But let's go back to Peter Blood and Arabella. So if you um, don't know the film, this is not their first conversation, but their second. Earlier, she has bought him as a slave at the slave market. And he's worked his way up already in this time where he's made himself indispensable as a doctor to the island's governor. So he's a lot more freedom at this point. He meets, runs into Arabella, and they have this conversation. And this is a little bit longer scene, but I'd like you to pay attention to how the music and dialogue are balanced, number one, and then also what music you're hearing and how you would describe it. What's the instrumentation? How would you, how does it make you feel? What kind of melody are you hearing? Just think a little bit more about that as we play this scene. <laughs> Well, 
Seems that you're continually doing me favors. Faith, I don't know why. Neither do I. Yes, I do. It's because you're so very grateful and always thank me so prettily. Sure, now, you don't blame me for resenting you and your favors. This is interesting. I've had men tell me they had reasons for admiring me, and some few have even had claims to reasons for loving me. But for a man to store up reasons for resenting me, how refreshing. You must tell me a few of them. The first is reason enough. You bought me. <laughs> I've had no lack of experiences in my time, but to be bought and sold was a new one. And I was in no mood to thank my purchaser. That I can understand. Go on. I've resented you because your name's Bishop. My thoughts have lumped you with your uncle. <laughs> How was I to know, be dead, that a devil could have... that a devil could have an angel for niece? From a resentful man, that is a pretty fair compliment. Have you any more reasons for resenting me like that one? Indeed I have, and the strongest of all. I've resented you because you're beautiful and I'm a slave. Do you understand that? I... I don't know. Perhaps if you were to explain further, I... I've already talked too much. You'll stay here without food or water until you talk. Why did you lie to your uncle? Because... Dr. Blood, you're a physician and should know. Is it not considered unhealthy for a slave to be seen at a boat? Why should it be? Boats put out to sea. Slaves may not. You're jumping at conclusions, aren't you? Am I? The governor will be waiting for you. Yes. Miss Bishop, it's difficult for an Irishman to apologize, but I hope you can forgive me for having thought badly of you. I will if you tell me how you think of me now. Oh, I think of you now. I think of you... I think of you as the woman who owns me, a slave. But I think the man is lucky who can count you his friend. I think you know you can. Your slave is grateful for all marks of favor. When you forget your slavery and go so far... Now there you're mistaken. However far this slave may go, he won't forget. Characteristic we Irish have in common with the elephants. So there's a lot to unpack in that scene, especially their first real meaty conversation. So aside from his terrible Irish accent <laughs> that he, he claims he's an Irishman. Um, how would you describe the music that we heard through most of their conversation? Or what instrumentation did we hear? Lots of strings. And where were those strings? Were they down here in a lower range? No, they were high, soaring strings. So part of that is a technical reason where we have a difference in range that the dialogue is more here in terms of register. The strings are up here, even the flute at the beginning. So we have that range separation makes it a little easier to hear because the dialogue is really important for understanding what's happening. But it's again mostly this soaring strings that's the same instrumentation as that second theme we heard in the main titles, and not all that dissimilar. It's more of variations or extensions of that. So in this way, we start to hear, oh, maybe that theme from the beginning is sort of linked to this relationship. Because also, what happens when he tries to kiss her? Does it sound successful in the score? No, we have this chromatic clash almost as she slaps him and then did anybody notice what motive or what music we heard immediately after it was the minor version of the theme Let's... 
when you forget your slavery and go so far. Now there you're mistaken. However far this slave may go, he won't forget. It's a characteristic we Irish have in common with the elephants. We hear that's that same minor version. He has not been successful. <laughs> So in here's here's that moment where he in this in Korngold's sketches where she spurns his advances. We have this build to this bigger chord, and then this chromatic clash and down, and it, it dissipates. So they don't really converse again until Captain Blood has been successful in escaping with his other fellow slaves commandeering a pirate or commandeering a ship of some invading forces and they're about to go live a life as pirates on the sea. So again in this scene notice what direction he looks like how he's framed in the camera versus how Arabella is framed and where their eyes match. So look for that and then also again think about what music we hear in this sequence. This is again the next time that they actually talk or like that we have some sort of relationship between them depicted. <laughs> What direction was Captain Blood looking? He was looking down out this way, and then when we cut to Arabella, is she also looking this way? No, she's looking this way. So that's part of creating that realism, that narrative continuity. We don't actually see them in one frame looking at each other, but the way that those shots are put together makes us think that, oh yes, he's looking off in the distance thinking of her. And sure enough, we cut to her, and she's looking the opposite way, so we interpret, ah, she's thinking about him. And this is doubled down by the fact of what, what are we hearing? That soaring strings, that same music we heard at the end of their last interaction. And then, in just as an aside, at the beginning of this clip, we hear the main theme, right? In that full bombastic brass. And he's, in, he's bedecked in his full pirate cap or outfit. <laughs> Moving on. At this point, <laughs> at this point in the sequence, he has just dueled Basil Rathbone and won, and now Arabella is his slave because she had been crossing back and forth during the Atlantic and she got captured by pirates. And so now he, she is his slave. So we see this role reversal. So there's a parallel in the language that they use to one another, but also, again, think about what you're hearing in this scene. But I thought you understood. You mean you thought you'd bought me? I suppose I should have regarded that as a compliment. You pirates are used to taking what you want without the formality of purchase. I advise you to go back to your ladies at Tortuga who are thrilled by your bold, lawless ways. I only hate you and despise you. I might have expected your thanks for what I've done this day. But very well, let it be so. I'm thief and pirate, and I'll show you how a thief and a pirate can deal. Once you bought me for 10 miserable pounds, now I bought you for considerably more. The amounts of no matter. What matters is that now I own you as you once owned me. You're mine, do you understand? Mine to do with as I please. But what music do we hear as they tell each other how much they hate each other? <laughs> it's that same soaring strings. And then we have that harmonized third there. This very almost, v I, to me it sounds almost Viennese, like something very Straussian, like something out of De Rosenkavalier. So it, it's, in, it's hinting to us, oh, they might say that they hate each other, but the best is yet to come. <laughs> so 
And then this is just, if you see the timestamp, this is just a minute afterward. Captain Blood has left. Arabella is talking to this other man on the ship who we're not quite sure who his identity is at this point. So again, thinking about what we hear. Beasts. Are you so much in love with him? In love with him? That you care so much what he does. Oh, I don't care in the least what he does. Well, someone should. <laughs> so what do we hear again? The strings, that soaring strings. And especially when we get to the sort of climax of it about love, it's that same climactic moment from when he kissed her. And back then, we hear this more chromatic clash it just sounds harsh and then it dissipates, it wafts out of the texture. But here, it has more resolution, a little more unexpected harmonically. But yes, we've got the harp as well. So I'll play just from there. But you care so much what he does. Oh, I don't care in the least what he does. Well, someone should. So we're building to something, but it's not quite this large um, orchestral climax that maybe we're expecting because it shifts a little bit, but we're moving toward there. We understand, even if we don't consciously understand, we know what's going to happen at the end of this movie at this point. <laughs> or we expect, we expect a certain, a certain end. And indeed, if we cut to the end... Isn't it true that you hate me? Hate you? Or is it that you love me? I'll hide you, and tonight, after dark, I'll find some way. You love me, don't you? Don't you? Whom else would I love? Now will you? You love me. Lord Willoughby, she loves me. Shh. <laughs> <laughs> so again, we hear that strings. And also, what's interesting to point out is that string melody we hear, there's more of this stepwise motion that's more this ascending stepwise motion that is even more similar to that very fur that theme in the opening titles. And so since it's so short, I'll play the scene one more time. Isn't it true that you hate me? Hate you? Or is it that you love me? I'll hide you. And tonight, after dark, I'll find some way. You love me, don't you? Don't you? Whom else would I love? Now will you? You love me. Lord Willoughby, she loves me. Shh. And these are some of the sketches from right there at the end. We see that ascending motion and then down. It's very much um, related to that first soaring string melody in the opening titles. So the bones of the score are there at the very beginning. We don't know necessarily what they're going to mean in the context of the film, but that is built over repetition of where and how it is paired with what is going on on screen. And that helps us read or understand or interpret a very specific meaning. And this film, I mean, this film is 1935. We're going on 90, it's what? 83 years later, these tropes, these interpreted meanings have not disappeared. We still expect certain gestures to mean certain things in the films that we watch, in any of the media that we watch, be it commercials, television, anything with this audio-visual pairing. So Korngold's legacy and part of that is not just in uh, the bombast or the sweep of his music. There's one moment I want to point out quickly here is I'm sure everybody is familiar with the Marvel films or a lot of the big blockbuster quasi-comedic action films that have been popular for the last couple of decades. And a popular or a common thread in a lot of these films is in the action sequence, people will be dueling and fighting and then will cut to a close-up of an individual, and they'll make some sort of funny clip, a quip. They'll say something entertaining. My best example of that is if you've seen Lord of the Lord of the Rings trilogy, when Gimli and Legolas are having a competition over who can kill more bad guys, 
and Legolas shoots one of the big mammoths and comes up in front of Gimli and he goes, that still only counts as one. So that kind of comedic quip is a common thread in swashbuckling films like this. So we do have a moment like that in Captain Blood. <laughs> Love thy neighbor as thyself. Leviticus 19, chapter 18, verse. So in Corn Gold Score mimics that. We have the brass music beforehand articulating the action sequence. Music cuts out, we have the quip, and then we have the main theme right there. This is a common sequence we hear in present day film, especially big bombastic. I've used that word a lot today, but I think it's fitting for this film and this style of film that we have that sequence. But even more readily apparent is if we think about the opening of King's Row, which is what we just screened it on Thursday night, but it's a Korngold film from 42. And the opening titles to that film might sound very similar to you if you don't know the movie. What film does that does that remind anybody of a film? Star Wars. Bum 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 bum. And then, well, Corngold wrote it first, so that's what Corngold did. But Will, John Williams takes it in his own direction, and he's talked about this. He's written about this a little bit. How this helped inspire him to write what he what he did for Star Wars. But the bones of that are in the past, and that past is classical Hollywood style. This sound, this style of music is still with us today and incredibly important to how we watch films, how we interpret the meaning behind them, and how we enjoy them. So in Korngold, coming at the right time in the 30s when that sound film was a really new medium. Like um, King Kong had only come out in 33. Sound technology wasn't even a decade old for synchronized uh, underscore and dialogue. It was not a de facto, or it was not inevitable that film would sound and look the way that it did. And Korgold comes along at this time and helps establish, along with other composers like Max Steiner, David Raxon, how films sound, and that lives with us to this day. So that's what I have for today before we watch the film at noon. We have some time for questions or comments or anything, but we would like to screen the film starting right at noon. So if you need to water, unwater, get, um, get any food, anything before the film starts. But I'm happy to take questions or talk more about Corn Gold. So the question was, does Korngold take time to create themes for individual characters? And, and yes, he does. I mean, both of the themes from the opening titles are pretty much, like, they're associated with Captain Blood, but none of the other characters in this film really have a theme of their own. Arabella, we sort of see through the lens of a Captain Blood adjacent theme, which leads us down this whole other track of the male gaze and Arabella is not this own individual with her own motivations. We're seeing her through Captain Blood. But there are other film scores like King's Row where he weaves so many different themes for each character together in one, it's almost a, a tone, po an audiovisual tone poem. In King's Row, he has a theme for Paris. He has a theme for Drake, AKA Ronald Reagan, for those of you who don't, played by Ronald Reagan, if you don't know. He has a theme for Randy. He has a theme for the doctor. He, ha he creates all of these individual themes. So it can depend, and some composers will do that to this day where they'll have a host of themes for individual characters. John Williams does this in Star Wars. There's a whole thematic catalog listing all of the different themes that he uses. But other composers like Michael Giacchino, who have who scored Up, he won his Oscar for Up about a, I guess that is a decade ago now. 
it, he has a more monothematic approach where it's one theme and he develops it in various ways. In Captain Blood, I think Korngold is more towards that, where he's really got two main themes that govern the entire score. And there's other musical material there. Like when they raise the British flag, we hear music that's fragments of God Save the King, or God Save the Queen, if we're talking in, 20, in the 21st century. But it's not really used as this theme to articulate relationships and ideas and identities. So it, it depends on the film. Well, silent film is so interesting because it has a completely di different set of aesthetic practices. So when you think about a sound film, like the sound films we see today, you're not necessarily meant to hear the music. Like you hear it, but you don't hear it. It's sort of this unheard melody. But silent film, because the performers were there performing and it's continuous throughout the film, it's more meant to be heard in a way. So it's a completely different a completely different paradigm, a different set of stylistic practices. I, mean, I think one way to think about it more is Korngold has, has talked about this in some of his past interviews when he was living, obviously, of um, he thought of films as quasi-operas. And that rings true a bit, especially something like King's Row, where you've got themes for every single character and there's all of the drama that happens, that there is that element to it. And that opera itself is this collaborative art, not unlike film, where there's no one person behind the creation of the entire thing that we consume. So the question was why this blossoming interest in Korngold in the last several decades where when he died in 57, he sort of disappeared for a couple decades, really until the 70s. And I think in part, but not solely, is what happens in the late 70s. We have the premiere of Jaws. We have Star Wars, Close Encounters of the Third Kind. These big, sweeping Hollywood films with big scores. And so there is this element there of that's popular, but I don't think that's the whole story, and I honestly don't know why either. I think part of this is things, things can happen. Why do some composers why, why don't we remember David Raxon in the way that we remember Korngold? Or why don't we remember Miklos Rosa in the way that we remember Korngold or, or Max Steiner? So I, I don't really know the answer to that either. Um, I think there's part of the sort of zeitgeist, the time of the 70s, but I don't think that's the complete answer. I think we have time for one more question. We want to make sure we have time to switch everything over for the film. Oh yeah, so Korngold wrote a lot of concert music. He wrote several opera, operas like Die Tote Stadt, uh, Die Wunder Helena, um, Die Catherine. He wrote a lot of chamber music, songs, um, symphonic works. And he, while he was composing for films in the 30s and 40s and living in the US, he was still trying to get his concert music performed. There's a couple items I have out there from 40 out of the display in 43 where he was getting the Philadelphia Orchestra under Eugene Ormandy to perform a Much Ado About Nothing suite. And, so, and that was a successful premiere. But some of the items are interesting because they all speak to his handwriting was terrible and they had to spend considerable expense in making readable parts for the orchestra. And then the performance went off very well and was received well. But um, so that during this whole time, he was composing concert music, so to speak. Where was he born? He was born in Vienna. 
All right, so we're, I'm being told we're out of time, so I'm happy to speak after the, out, out of the display afterward about anything more corn gold, and please stay and enjoy watching Captain Blood in its entirety. Even though you know the ending, it's still a great film to watch. <laughs>